Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the HP-sponsored Lightning Talks. We've got a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, just before I hand it over to our first speaker, uh, I want to tell you about the draw that we're doing during this session. So if you don't already have a ticket, please raise your hand to uh, receive one. You'll get uh, one half of the ticket. And if you're an HP employee, you do not qualify. <laughs> and we're gonna, you get a chance to win this beautiful, it's actually a very beautiful 10-inch tablet uh, that runs Android. So these are lightning talks. They're going to be five minutes and just five minutes. So I apologize if I have to cut somebody off. It's not me trying to be rude. We just have uh, eight or nine presenters today. Canadians, we, we, do, we do try not to be. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so keep your hands raised up if you're interested in that ticket. We first have uh, Lance Albertson coming up. He's, from, he's the director of the Open Source Labs at uh, OSU. So round of applause for him. All right, so uh, my name is Lance Albertson. I'm the director of the Open Source Lab. If you don't know what we do, we provide infrastructure hosting for a lot of medium to large open source projects. I deal with uh, from Apache to, to uh, Linux Foundation and a whole bunch. So we, we dive into a lot of stuff. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, our adventures in installing OpenStack and using it with Chef. Um, and this slide is supposed to have a cat in it, but it doesn't. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyways, as we all know, there's lots of services. It's really complicated. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, there's so many different ways we can install it. Um, me being a system administrator, I like having control. I like using the tools that I'm used to. Um, and we've recently gone towards using Chef. So um, what we did was Chef to the rescue. Uh, Chef really helped us out, but it was really complicated in the beginning. Um, we like it because we use it. Um, Everything was on StackForge, which is great. Um, I had a really good rep repository to kind of lay things out, but it was a little complicated. Um, There's lots of moving parts. It was kind of difficult to kind of see how everything was needed. Um, me being a new OpenStack user at the time, it was kind of uh, intimidating to kind of figure that out. So what we ended up doing was, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Chef, you create a wrapper cookbook. So we created our own cookbook called OSL-OpenStack. It's actually in our GitHub. Um, when we kind of wrapped what uh, <coughs> Chef or in the Stack Forge had provided with cookbooks, and we kind of put on our own little things. Um, so it worked out really well. Um, we could deal with site-specific things that we were doing. Um, we could simplify how we were deploying our, our databases, kind of fit with how we do things. Um, one thing that was really annoying at the beginning with the Chef deployment is there was too many roles. Um, it was just so many different roles. It was modular, and we just pared it down to exactly what we needed. So we had a controller node, and we had a compute node, eventually a sender node, and so forth. So it's been really good, um, and it's working out pretty great. Um, to do that, we uh, used a tool called Test Kitchen. Um, it's a part of the Chef ecosystem. It's an integration testing tool. Um, it's really awesome. Um, it's, uh, it uses Vagrant by default, but what we actually ended up doing is once we got our OpenStack instances up, we could uh, use OpenStack to do our integration testing on Chef. So OpenStack's really helped us out on that side of things. So the uh, Kitchen OpenStack provider is awesome, and it works really, really well. So we can do a lot of integration testing, right? tests and everything. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about was Packer. Um, Packer is a cloud image creation tool. Um, for those of you that uh, know the guy who created Vagrant, the same guy created Packer. Um, it is an awesome, awesome tool. Um, one of the things that I, I deal with a lot of different platforms at the Open Source Lab, and I don't want to have to deal with five different tools to create an image. I want to have a, a sensible way of doing that, and that's what Packer does. I can make an image for Vagrant. I can make an image for OpenStack. I can make an image for anything, any platform. Um, Chef actually has a repository called Bento that basically has all the various Packer scripts that they use. It also has um, 
a, a lot of the things that you don't need to worry about when you're creating VMs on different platforms, like oh, this on Debian you have to do this weird thing with networking and so forth. So what we did is we actually forked it, and their repository is really built on Vagrant, um, but we wanted to make OpenStack VMs using it. So we forked it, created our own VMs. So if you want to be able to build all of your OpenStack VMs on various platforms, check out our fork and and. Well, except pull requests. I need to talk with JJ and the chef folks to actually get it incorporated upstream. So that's my talk. I don't know how much under five minutes I was at. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Next, we have uh, Jay Henderson, or Hendrickson, sorry. So is he in the room? All right, great. Uh, so for the folks that are just joining, uh, if you haven't received your uh, your ticket to enter this draw over here. Raise your hand, and we'll have one of my uh, lovely staff members come over and give you a ticket. All right, what's going on? All right, so uh, oh, there it is. you found it. Cool. We start. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Hendrickson, and I'm a product manager at HP, and we're going to talk about uh, hardware. Somebody raising their hand? What, you have, oh, okay, sorry, sorry. So, uh, so OpenStack, software, um, but deep underneath all of that stuff, there's hardware, and it's not there just to create heat. It's actually um, the, the, fundamental, uh, the fundamental infrastructure underneath OpenStack. So we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit about designing um, the hardware stack. So first is um, when you first start designing your hardware uh, stack, you, the, you, you have to create a plan. And so the first question you might ask yourself is, what distribution should I use? So you could go to um, OpenStack Foundation and grab an, all these modules and pin them together and after several months or years put, have, have some type of distro. Or you could go and get a distro from some of the many vendors that are out there. One is HP Helion, Red Hat has one, SUSE has one, Ubuntu has one, my dog has a distro. It's, um, it's pretty good. It's got a couple of issues, but it's pretty good. But once you, once you come up with the distro that you're going to use, um, you're faced with the complexity of architecting this this uh, hardware, and the thing that you want to think about is you can't just say, okay, well, what are public clouds using? I'll just use that same hardware because uh, the, the hardware, if you, if you do that, um, you're going to have some serious issues, especially if it's your first private cloud. Uh, if, if you have 20,000 racks of servers and you use a rip and replace type of hardware, that works great. When, you have your, when you're building your first uh, private cloud, it may be a very small cloud in a rack, and if you have a node go out there, it could be catastrophic. So you need to think about the types of um, hardware that you might use, and it's going to be a little bit different. Um, the next thing is you need to expect that your workloads are going to change. So if you're doing traditional IT, uh, maybe, uh, you know, when I say traditional, I mean all the way up through virtualization, but you haven't done a cloud before. When you get a cloud working, the behaviors of the users are going to change. Think of it like uh, your mom's favorite uh, meatloaf recipe. And so for, for years and years and years, you've been making mom's meatloaf, and it's great. Then you take a culinary class. And you start saying, you know, I think, what if I try this? What if I may use less butter? What if I use more of this? What? Well, the, the thing is, your recipe starts to change. And, and how you cook things starts to change. But that, that all happens after you took the class. So your workloads are going to change. You, you think you know what your workloads are, but you don't know what you don't know, and they are going to change. So you need to think about the hardware that's underneath because those workloads will change. So um, you need to expect that you're going to scale up, and you need to expect that you're going to scale out. In other words, you're going to add more memory to nodes. You're going to add more CPU uh, power, you're going to add more hard drives for storage, you're going to do all kinds of things, and you're also going to scale out. Um, when you build a cloud, you start out with something small and you build it out, but you want to do that. And then you want to mitigate risk, and because after all, you're building a private cloud, you're going to spend, I don't know, half a million dollars, $400,000, you put your badge down, you go to your CIO, you say, I want to spend all this money. Uh, you know, maybe you want to think about getting 
um, some reliable hardware, some hardware that um, is easily managed, some hardware that's flexible that you can redeploy as things change. So you want to be able to do that. And then, of course, the last thing is how much time do you have? So I'm going to get to the point, and let's talk about hardware design. So first, um, there's the, the management control plane. Now, I work for HP. I'm in HP server division, so the best... Uh, the best uh, hardware platform for, for the management control plane is DL360, one of the largest, or excuse me, one of the most popular servers on the planet. And, and we do this, now I'm not going to specify how many nodes you need and all this in the, in the, in the plane because it kind of depends on the, uh, the distro that you're using and how things are deployed. So I'm, I'm going to kind of leave that up there for a second. Then compute. So we use DL360. and. We use DL360s for our compute. They're very flexible. They're very reliable. We use 18-core Haswell processors in these Gen 9 platforms because it keeps a, a nice, dense compute um, platform. Um, let's see. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll not read all this stuff out to you. I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more. For Swift Store, we use DL380s. We use large form factor drives um, because we're looking, for we're looking for capacity, not necessarily speed. Um, again, uh, they're extremely flexible as, as your OpenStack platform changes, you, you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to, uh, time's, up. time's up, okay. Any last, any last message? Last thing, wait, there's more. Designing the hardware stack for your OpenStack private cloud, that is on Wednesday at 4.30, and I won't have to rush. Thank you so much, that was great. All right, next up we're going to have the very funny and uh, very personable Clint Byram. And a ticket for the draw yet? Raise your hand. Clint May. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. So this talk is like a Lord of the Rings marathon viewing party, and I'll explain that in a moment. Why is it not on the screen? Please make it on the screen, Cody. No. That's fine. Can everybody read that? All right. Can I talk now? Mirrored would be awesome. Does anybody know the high key for full screen for Adobe? Aha. There you go. If the keyboard controls work, it'll actually work. All right, so I will explain why this talk is like a Lord of the Rings marathon viewing party, including the extended ex uh, edition. But first, I want to thank HP for having lightning talks and thank the OpenStack Foundation for putting on this event. Uh, also, I want to remind everybody that all of these words I'm about to say are not the words of HP. They are mine, so please don't get me fired. It is like a Lord of the Rings viewing party because by halfway through this, you will be jealous of Gandalf for having fallen to his death about halfway through. So now I have a question for you. Does anybody know why OpenStack is like Chewbacca? By the way, there's zero content in this presentation. <laughs> so you're welcome. Okay, OpenStack is like Chewbacca because outsiders don't understand a word it says, and if you do it wrong, it'd probably tear your arms off. Next. OpenStack is like a MiG-29. It's a beautiful aircraft. That is not why it's like OpenStack, though. It's like OpenStack because now that Larry Ellison owns one, nobody expects him to use it for its intended purpose. <laughs> Switching to guns. All right, so this is for our host country. Thank you very much for your hospitality, Canada. I'm about to get thrown out, I think. <laughs> why is OpenStack like poutine? No, not this Putin. I am not making any jokes about this man. Not that one. This Putin. Because right now you're all excited to try it, but by the end of the week you're going to be full of regret. 
I'm kidding. They're delicious. They're delicious. All right. So why is OpenStack like Canada? Anyone? Because it's awesome. All right. I like that one better. Oh. All right. No, because it's full of extremely polite people, except when the decision on what language to use comes up, and then the gloves come off. Le <laughs> baton. All right, and why is OpenStack like the Holy Grail? <laughs> Ouch, that hurts as a developer. It does exist. All right, because it promises all sorts of magical things, but it only delivers violently ejected cattle. <laughs> all right, and why is this summit like the Rocky Horror Picture Show? All right, because it started out as a couple of lost kids in the woods but I think they're gonna try and serve us meatloaf at the HP party. <laughs> it is getting out of hand, folks. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. Thank you and try the fish. So uh, that's gonna be a tough one to follow up, but uh, I'd like to welcome up uh, Shreem. He's an MVP, is he here in the room? All right. Cloud Dunn, he, uh, better known as Cloud Dunn. Hello, everybody. There's this really wonderful usable operating system called Linux. <laughs> yeah, just try it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I cannot possibly beat what Clint did, and um, well, I try my best. So, <laughs> but uh, I think I'm last, so uh, th there's a respite there. It's just end of the first day. I'm already tired. We got four more days. Um, I can relate. So uh, I'm Sriram Subramanian. I'm founder of uh, Cloud Dawn, a research analysis and SI firm. I'm also an HP Helion MVP. I've been plugged with the OpenStack community since Cactus days. Uh, started with my first uh, install from Diablo. Um, I'm here to talk about how HP Helion portfolio can uh, help with your DevOps um, strategy. Now, uh, who can uh, define DevOps? What is DevOps? Well, if anybody knows, uh, I would like to meet you in person. I want to learn from you guys. <laughs> but until then, um, I'll start with the common uh, DevOps tool chain. And uh, again, it's a very short talk. I can, I can spend an entire hour talking about DevOps or uh, what we can do and what are all the options available. I'm just going to pick one and then try to see how uh, possibly moving to HP Helion portfolio can help you, right? This is one typical uh, tool chain. There's a various components here, build, CI, deploy, right? And then there are other tools and, and, and files that you would use like a backup or configuration management or source control. There's also like commonly used software for planning or issue tracking or um, collaboration, right? Now, uh, you have a lot of infrastructure going on here. You, you'll probably have different environments, right? Uh, something to maintain, manage your CI server, uh, manage your uh, backup service, storage behind it, storage backend for that. So you have the complexity, uh, operational complexity here to, man to, uh, to watch for. You have the multitude of environments and heterogeneous environments here. And finally, as an app developer, you want to focus on your app. You don't really want to care about infrastructure. I'm not saying that you, the, the pain of infrastructure will go away or, or possibly you can move away completely, but at least like by suitable choices, you can, have, you can hope to have a, a, a better environment so that you, you can have more focus on app. But if you look at them, right, like, um, again, um, just like DevOps, I cannot possibly list everything on the HP Helion portfolio. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, IIS and PaaS. And then if you go back to your slide, or if you look at the uh, components here, some of them are services, some of them are software, and some of them um, kind of you can't call them as files or just block storages, uh, right? And of course, there's people and process, a key part of DevOps. You cannot get away with that. Um, so uh, one possible way that you can improve your DevOps tool chain is like, try to see if you can run your software on your IIS layer, right? Either it's HP Helion OpenStack or HP Public Cloud. And then uh, try to move your services wherever possible to the PaaS layer. 
So what it could lo look like if you move, move to this, uh, you, are, you can replace your build with Maven, for instance, and then your deploy and CI with uh, HP Helion CLI. You can try to replace your monitoring services with New Relic that comes with it. And then if you try taking out your services and then try running on VMs or instances on IIS layer, then what you end up is still like you still have to manage these things, but you will end up with um, a homogeneous environment, a homogeneous infrastructure. So you can take away the pain. Uh, you can probably, uh, you can probably, you can also uh, call that you can putting everything in your one basket, and if that fails, that's also going to be a problem. But at least you have a homogeneous environment here as infrastructure, so you can focus more on your application. Now, again, I want to say this is just a, just just like a possible indication or possible uh, implementation. Uh, this is not going to solve all your issues, but something that you can think about. And uh, you can I, I request you to take a look at HP Helion portfolio and see how it can help you with your DevOps um, processes. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up uh, at Sriram at cloudon.com or hit me on Twitter at Sriram here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, next we have uh, someone from HP Labs, and I'm excited to introduce him. He goes by JK. So where's JK? Perfect. He's going to talk about something pretty interesting with regards to Neutron, which is, I know, all of our favorite topic. Hi, everyone. I'm J.K. Lee from HP Labs. I'm here to talk about an interesting way to express your uh, complex networking policies and how to automatically compose them. So uh, network management is challenging. Policy management is challenging because there are many different types of policies, starting from security access control, QoS, middle box deployment. But the current interfaces for them are pr uh, mostly fragmented and pretty low level. There is no single pane of glass where you can manage them all together in one place. And there are many different silos or stakeholders who have different versions of networking policies on the, sheer, the common network, starting from operators, tenants, and application admins. And we may also have uh, some computerized programs like SDN apps who dynamically generate uh, networking policies uh, triggered by external events like a security and fault events. But currently, the way to detect such uh, conflicts between many different policies uh, typically angry phone calls from customers, hey, my network doesn't work. Or then the way to resolve that conflict requires some human effort to make another rounds of phone calls and then you know, try to decide which one is more important or not. So it's a little bit messy. So we propose a solution called the PGA, Policy Graph Abstraction. This is an application level graph abstraction that allows users to specify their policy very naturally uh, as simple as drawing whiteboard diagrams, when we typically do just discuss and reason about our networking policies. So um, we have a couple of examples from uh, real policies. For example, the application administrator, Graph B, is allowing port 80 traffic, HTTP traffic, from employees to the web just by drawing this graph. And then traffic should go through a load balancer marked as an LB box. And it also allows the traffic from web to DB and DB to DB by using the self fetch allowing port 7000. We have another interesting example, graph C, which is SDNF from HP Net Protector. And it basically monitors the DNS traffic from normal hosts. And if something goes wrong or an anomaly is detected, then the host is quarantined. And then quarantine host can only talk to the remedy server. And this is a kind of exclusive access control intent and we use, uh, we have an intent API by basically marking that node as an exclusive, that uh, the node edges cannot be changed at all, while no other edges can be added to this uh, quarantine host. And so we have another kind of intent level APIs that helps users to clearly define and clarify their user intents. For example, the cloud operator has a dotted edge to just express their pure service chain requirement, which has nothing to do with access control intent. So we have an algorithm to compose them together into something like this. Um, you know, although the in each individual policy graph look very simple, the composed graph can be a little bit hard to manually compose. So we have an automated algorithm that uh, is also scalable, and it took about 60 minutes to compose uh, 20K enterprise IT ICA policies. 
And you can easily walk through the graph and see that, for example, the engineering department deployed on campus A, quarantined, uh, marked as a, the blue node, can only talk to the memory server, while the engineering department and campus A with the normal status can have a connectivity to other servers or host through the chain of uh, service chain as required by the individual input graphs. So currently, we are integrating this into uh, OpenStack Horizon GUI for, uh, to enable users to easily drag and drop the policy graphs and edit them. And then we compose them together using our graph composer, which is ready to be downloaded and deployed down to the Neutron through our extension. And we currently plan to work with Congress for uh, a virtual machine labeling and uh, dynamic policy enforcement based on uh, dynamic ex external events. Um, we have a brown back session uh, Wednesday, 11.30, so we can talk a little bit more about that if you can join our session. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, next I'm going to invite Monty Taylor. A lot of you know him. He's a, a distinguished technologist at HP. He's also a member of the technical committee and a member of the, the uh, OpenStack board. And he's going to give us an interesting presentation on why we should ditch cloud in it. Possibly interesting. Uh, except now I've got to look over there. There's the, okay, that's fine. Uh, so hi, uh, uh, I'm Monty, and I'm going to talk to you about Glean, which is the thing that I wrote to replace CloudNet because CloudNet wasn't working out for me. Uh, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, so uh, so it turns out when you boot a VM, uh, you need to kind of um, oh I can see it down there. That's exciting. Uh, when you boot a VM, um, uh, you need some some boot time data. You can't you can't bake everything in. Uh, some things uh, in fact uh, change uh, depending on. Uh, what's happening at the time you boot it. Um, uh, also, as a, as a pre, uh, precursor to this, I, I use Ansible for orchestration. So I don't need a lot of bootstrapping at boot time. I, I, need, a, a very, I need a very minimal set of things. So I don't need, I don't need uh, something with like ability to execute uh, extremely intricate scripts or install things uh, onto my VM when I boot it. Uh, I need something to get an SSH key on there. Uh, uh, maybe network. Uh, depending on, um, on on how bong hits things are, um, so uh, so there, there's a few things that I, I absolutely have to consume at boot. There there's really no other choice for uh, for it, um, and that's that's basically network configuration. Um, uh, it's it's the I suppose I could build an individual image for every single different node uh, in a non dynamically uh, uh, allocated network, um, <laughs> but something tells me I would be uh, blamed as being even more insane than people think that I am right now. Uh, Maybe SSH keys. So uh, you can actually bake SSH keys into, a, into an image that you're deploying, uh, which we do. Um, but sometimes uh, you may also want to be able to overlay a different SSH key that you, you might want to use, maybe say in a test uh, rig, or maybe you don't like the idea of baking a public key into an image because you're freaked out by uh, putting a public key somewhere that people can see it. I don't really know why you'd be freaked out by that, uh, since it's called a public key for a reason, but uh, I, there's many things that happen that I don't understand why. Um, so the thing is, the network information part of this should be really easy, because there's this dynamic uh, host configuration protocol uh, called the dynamic host configuration protocol. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. Uh, just about everybody on the planet uses it, and has done so for 20 to 30 years. Um, it's, it's, it's basically the basic thing that allows you to get, you know, IP addresses on your on your machines when they boot. Um, some people, for some reason, that uh, surpasses understanding uh, almost as much as my obsession with this picture. Uh, if you've seen my other talk today, uh, uh, decide that they don't like to use that in their in their data centers um, uh, because they're uh, completely out of their ever-loving minds. Um, because uh, what those people think is a better idea is to run a custom-written agent on a on a on a node that's going to do a file injection and overwrite my own config files that I stuck onto the node. Uh, I find that rude. Um, so uh, the thing with Cloudinit is that it's great uh, and it it 
solved a lot of problems for a lot of the world, uh, and it handles many cases. It doesn't handle all of the cases. Uh, it especially doesn't handle this particular case uh, where the networking information isn't uh, actually available uh, in, uh, in, in standard places. Um, part of that uh, has to do uh, with uh, uh, patches that haven't landed to OpenStack yet. Uh, it also has some dependencies that uh, conflict with my particular use case, which is using uh, spinning up nodes that we use to test OpenStack. Um, Cloud Init also depends on the same things that OpenStack depends on, uh, which means that testing the dependencies in OpenStack that I'm trying to test is hard. Uh, it's also kind of frozen because they're rewriting it. Um, so rather than wait for that to sort itself out, I wrote a thing called Glean. Uh, it's small. It has zero dependencies. Uh, it only handles uh, static network config in config drive or falling back to DHCP uh, if your environment is sane. Uh, and optionally, it will uh, read some SSH keys out of the config drive. And it doesn't do anything else. Uh, because that doesn't make any sense. So um, in, there's a patch up to, uh, to Nova to put something like this into config drive. Uh, hopefully, uh, the Nova team will land this in Liberty. And if Nova team doesn't, I'm going to find you and delete all your code. Um, uh, but there's a thing like that, and you can uh, generate some static config from it. Uh, it's already integrated with Disk Image Builder, so if you want to make an image that uses this, uh, Disk Image Create, uh, Debian Minimal, VM Simple in it will get you a Debian uh, image bootable in a cloud uh, that uses this to handle all of its, uh, all of its uh, boot time initialization. Um, you know what has less depends than Minimal Python, though? Uh, if you thought I was crazy for that, uh, there's this language called Rust that they just released as a 1.0. Um, uh, and I, I do have a, a version of Glean that's, uh, that's in Rust uh, that, you can, that you can play with. We're not using this anywhere. Uh, it's not integrated with anything because <laughs> they just released Rust as 1.0. Uh, so, uh, but that actually has even less runtime dependencies. Uh, and that's the crazy thing that I'm going to talk to you about today. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Monty. All right, next we're going to have uh, Godwin um, come up and speak about uh, open sexual telemetry, which is something that is near and dear to a lot of our hearts. All right. Um, my name is Godwin F. Young. I'm with OpenStack Professional Services. I'm going to talk about uh, Monasca, monitoring as, as a service at scale. Uh, this is typically a presentation we give in one hour, but since I have five minutes, I'm going to go rush through. <laughs> OK. <coughs> um, the mon <laughs> OK. Monitoring, as uh, needless to say, monitoring has been around for decades. However, the existing solutions do not address um, the problems or requirements of large-scale public and private clouds in terms of performance, data retention, and scalability. Traditionally, performance and uh, um, scalability and data retention have been limited to hundreds of, just hundreds of servers. But we know that in a typical large-scale enterprise cloud system, there are thousands of uh, physical servers and hundreds of thousands of VMs that need to be monitored. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Why is it doing that? Excuse me. So um, monitoring a service uh, addressed by solutions such as Amazon's CloudWatch is simply not enough. I mean, it's, uh, it's not enough in the case that it's not open source. So now that we've addressed the problem, my question to you is, what is the solution? So the solution is Monasca. Monasca is an extensible, uh, scalable monitoring solution that leverages state-of-the-art analytics database. All components in Monasca can be scaled out and clustered for fault tolerance. All of its components are done via REST API. And the API su uh, supports querying metrics and measurements. With Monasca, we get what we don't get with other open source systems. We get metrics, alarm definitions, threshold calculations, all done server side. Existing monitoring solutions such as Nagios and Zabbix do not even come close to the performance scale and data retention capabilities of Monasca. 
Uh, what really sets Monasca apart is the separation of alarm definitions from um, the alarm creations based by using threshold engine patterns. Uh, here, I'm not going to really go into the details, but basically this is the uh, Monasca high, very high level architecture. Um, it uses the REST API that, I, like, as I mentioned, um, all the REST API authenticates against OpenStack Keystone services, and uh, all of them is, all of the uh, APIs are associated with tenants, and it supports multi-tenancy. All of the metrics are published through uh, Kafka messaging queue. It, has, it also has a notification engine, engine that consumes alarm state transition messages from the message queue and also sends notifications such as emails to users when um, alarms exist. Um, we use uh, uh, Kafka, as I mentioned earlier, and it also uses MySQL and uh, plugs in exist for HBase and Cassandra, uh, even for Vertica, HBase is Vertica. And I'm not going to talk about that. Um, the Monasca UI as you can see here, is uh, fully integrated into OpenStack Horizon dashboard. Basically what it does, it's, it, it visualizes the overall health and status of the core components of OpenStack. So we can see like the Cinda, Nova, monitoring, Swift and all. And uh, we have the VMs shown as DevStack and Minimon down there. Uh, Monasca has also been integrated with uh, open source metric dashboards called Grafana, uh, grafana.org over there. Um, so Monasca is fully open source. Uh, the code is uh, in the StackForge repository in GitHub. Uh, it is not at this moment currently an OpenStack incubated project, but we are targeting incubation. We are working with uh, the Slimiter PTLs and talk about how to integrate it into OpenStack. Um, it is being used in production uh, by companies like Time Warner Cable and Workday. People who are contributing, or companies that are contributing to the code include HP, Rackspace, and uh, you can see the logos all there, Cisco, IBM, CloudScale, and IBM. Uh, my call to action to you right now is we are basically looking for developers and contributors. Basically, this is an internal project we're working on in HP, but we're looking for more developers and contributors to work on things like uh, testing performance, benchmarking, and integration into OpenStack Horizon. Thank you. Finally, I guess. Uh, the resources of, uh, you can check out the links there. Uh, those are the links for Monasca. Uh, the wiki page is there, wiki.openstack.org, wiki Monasca. Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause for uh, my good friend Godwin. So Monasca is uh, in, in Stackforge, I think, so you can actually go and see the code and everything like that. If you're if you're curious, so next up, I'm going to have uh, a colleague um, from the NFV group come up, uh, Tariq, as well as his colleague from Brocade. It's on this one. Has Ben here? Uh, so we're kind of short on time. Can you do your, your presentation at the same time? Just two, do two at the same time? <laughs> oh boy. Going last wasn't a good idea, especially after Jay Leno and the guy who rewrote uh, Cloud in it. <laughs> All right. So this is not my presentation. I cannot do NFE. I was joking about you doing at the same time. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, you want me to go first, and then you guys go. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. So I'm going to close this if it's okay with you, and uh, open up my presentation, <laughs> and put that on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Let's see where it is. Yeah, mine is not about NFE. Actually, it's not technical at all. Oh, really? Okay, so we go NFE and then I do mine? Yeah. Okay. Here you go. I guess this is ours. Okay. Why don't you? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, as you can see, we are so well matched right now, you know, dressed exactly the same and, and look exactly the same as well. So, <laughs> Tom, why don't you go ahead and open it up and then. Uh, yeah, hi. 
Um, I'm Tom Nadeau from Brocade. I uh, run our open uh, uh, open source uh, projects, Open Daylight, OpenStack, uh, OPNFE. Um, so we got together, I don't know, about a month ago uh, and started talking about why don't we build, um, you know, a sort of a, a commercial version of uh, an open source orchestrator mm -hmm. and set out to prove that you could do this and that it works and, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I think this was your slide. Oh no, this was my slide. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so we had kind of a scheduling snafu and I found out like 10 minutes ago I needed to be here, so sorry if I'm a little discombobulated. Um, so one of the things that like we talked about and I've, I've talked to with like a lot of my customers and stuff about is, is that, um, you know, they're kind of sick of, you know, should I say VMware? Um, and, and so they're, you know, they, they look at all of this, this swirl of open source components and they say, Hey, isn't there a way to put these things together to actually give me an open source version of this for all the obvious reasons. Right. Um, and you know, so I guess the, you know, in what, five minutes or less, we're supposed to explain that this is possible. I mean, maybe it's obvious to you all in here, um, but, uh, you know, we go out and we talk to people and they go, really, you can do this and it works. And, and yeah, no kidding. This works. Um, so we put together a demo for the uh, layer one, two, three thing two weeks ago. Works great, less filling, uh, all that stuff. And you know, basically, we put together Brocade's Open Daylight distro um, with our virtual router and OVS and HP Helion um, and your orchestrator, which I forget it's called HP Orchestrator, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and worked great. And I think, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing was that when we started talking about it, uh, it's uh, in NFV, if you look at it, uh, what's happening in the IT, and NFV is trying to accelerate it in the network. And it's a lot of things we in IT feel that it's already taken care of. In NFV, where people are, are talking about it quite a lot, but not many are doing. So as part of this demo, what we wanted to show was that what the art of the possible is and how myth versus reality actually works. So we're talking about a lot of things, and you know, we at HP, we have a lot of slides, but uh, you know, being able to show a working thing, even though simple, that's what we showed, and we thought what's a better way of showing in using the, the work that's going, being done with so many different uh, open source, open standard bodies, and, and under the auspices of op NFE, and I'm hoping some of you got a chance to uh, attend some of the sessions today. In, with using op NFV as, as the host, uh, two, two different companies who have different products, we were able to bring them together so quickly and be able to, to show this uh, development time, demo development time of you know, less than two weeks. Of that two weeks, a uh, lot of the problem was people were on vacation, oh, different meetings, yeah, <laughs> meetings and different time zones, but we were able to put it together just because it's based on open standards. And as you see, we were able to use uh, HP's distribution of OpenStack, Brocade's distribution of, uh, of Open Daylight Controller, and we were able to bring it together in, uh, in this time and being able to show a site failover. And site failover, you'll see, and uh, you'll say, you know, folks in networks, we've been doing it since, you know, networks have been around. But the beauty of this was this site failover was based on on analytics. So what, what the art of the possible it showed was that if a site goes down, you don't have to blindly move everything over to the other side. You can, you can send analytics to, to a orchestrator that can then provide some commands or controls over to the ODL based controller that can direct part of the components to one side, part of the other ones, all based on analytics. And we did it uh, very quickly because of uh, what uh, open source, open standards have been able to bring it. Thank you very much. So, we should also say, I think the, the demo that we did is recorded or will be recorded soon. Yeah, it is recorded, it's available uh, as part of OPNFV. It was done working with AT&T who came up with the use case. And yep. it is available for anyone who needs it. It's available and we're also, I mean, we're showing a demo at our booth um, of, of basically the same thing this week as well. So All right, thank you very much. All right, so we have one more last presentation. I know that we're a little over, so I apologize, but I'm hoping that the chance to win this tablet over here is going to make it all worthwhile. So I'd like to now uh, bring up uh, Tom, so he can actually, or sorry, Ben, 
that was Tom. And uh, he's going to give us a pretty interesting presentation. So, but he might need some help. So I think uh, we can just drag, just drag it. it over. Hello everyone. So this is going to be, I know you guys had a lot of technical uh, sessions today, so I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, my name is Ben Zadeh. I'm part of Helion OpenSec Professional Service Team. My background is development, um, but part of my research uh, during my graduate program was on technology adoption because human psychology was very, very interesting to me. So I want to talk to you about behaviors that lead to technology adoption, human behaviors that lead to technology adoption, and how we can make, how can, how can we use some of those and those learnings and apply them to OpenStack. So this is a picture of a brain before and after it was triggered by enjoyable experience. And as you can see, it's common sense, enjoyable experience triggered more activities. And you may be wondering how that may relate to OpenStack. So many companies have figured out a way to directly connect pleasurable experience to money, to adoption. And one of those was Cialis. Cialis came to market late. The market was dominated by another product. And they, they had to come up with a strategy. So their strategy was is coupons. Now, if you take a picture of this coupon and take it to your local pharmacy, you get three free pills. And they figured out that when people are using these three pills, if they approach them during that time period and give them more information, it is more likely that they adopt that product because they experienced the product. They had a positive experience. Now, you may argue that taking a, using OpenStack is more complicated tech than, than taking a Cialis. Definitely involves more people. <laughs> so, so with Cialis, you have one, two, if you're lucky, maybe three people involved. But with OpenStack, you have a you have a chain. You have a multiple players, mul multiple decision makers. They have dissimilar viewpoints. They have dissimilar interests. On the other hand, the product is different. You have a product that's open source. It has many challenges, unanswered questions, and it's disruptive. It's disruptive to many players. So for us to be able to measure adoption when it comes to a technology like OpenStack, we need, to, we need to look at the entire chain that it impacts. We cannot evaluate factors just by evaluating one part of that chain. Now, what are the constructs that we need to look at? So that's why I want to introduce you to these two models. These are technology adoption models. They've been researched to death. I promise you that. But both of them, technology adoption, te technology acceptance model, and the uh, theory of plant be uh, behavior, they both tell us that the main constructs that you want to look at is perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. Now, loyalty, trust, all those play a factor, but they all lead to, into these two constructs. If you measure these, and if you have these two, then there's a, there's a p huge possibility for, for, your, for your customer to, to have the intention to use a product. So, so take that. Now, so if you have dispersed multi-directional POCs within an organization, you cannot truly measure those two factors that I just mentioned, perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use, truly, because, because you're, you're measuring one part of organization. You're not looking at the entire chain. You need to look at the entire chain, how that impacts the entire chain to be able to truly measure if your organization will adopt OpenStack. And that's why I introduce you to Spock. I call it trademark. Right? Spock is a super POC. It's not a normal POC. It's a POC that goes beyond just your DevOps to standing up 16 nodes of OpenStack and try to do what they do with VMware. It involves your developers. They need to develop something that is a cloud-ready application and test that on your OpenStack environment. It involves your business leaders to measure and do cost analysis, analyze the burst into cloud, compare that to traditional systems or whatever they have in place. And that requires a little bit of, the, so that's my call into action. That was my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. So I, uh, I appreciate everybody sticking around. I know that we're a little bit over. I'd like to now do the draw for the HP Slate, which I assume is why you're all still here. So I'd actually like to call B. Dale Garby up to actually do the draw. So you might know B. Dale Garby. He's a former, um, P I was going to say PTL, uh, something or another for Debian, whatever they call it. Does everybody have a ticket? <laughs> and while we're waiting to get those tickets, I just a few more things. After this, you can go down to our booth. We're going to have actual live racks of hardware there that's demonstrating hardware from multiple vendors. Very exciting. We also have a number of live interactive demos. Be sure to check out our awesome area over here called the uh, Community Lounge. It's amazing view. And we're giving away s'mores, um, beer, and uh, these hoodies. And you can actually get badges ironed onto them. There's like keystone badges and everything. Yeah, there's free beer. We do that. Actually, I'd like to note that there's free beer at our lounge every day after 3 o'clock. Beer and s'mores and fire pits and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and party Tuesday night. All right. Well, I got a number from B. Dale here. It is 816-072. You have it? All right, sweet. Yeah. Woo! Very good. All right. Round of applause for the winner. Thank you so much.